The following program is paid for by the friends and partners of Joyce Meyer Ministries. One Sunday, a pastor preached a sermon on honesty. Well, Monday morning, he took the bus to get to his office. He paid the fare, and the bus driver gave him back too much change. During the rest of the journey, the pastor was rationalizing how God had provided him with some extra money he needed for the week. But he just could not live with himself. So before he got off the bus, he proceeded to give back the extra money and said to the driver, you've made a mistake and given me too much change. The driver smiled and said, there was no mistake. I was at your church yesterday and heard you preach on honesty, so I decided to put you to the test this morning. <laughs> Can I just simply say to you that the world is watching? They need to see us living the life that we say that we believe. I can tell you that just trying to preach to people without living the life probably does more harm than it does good. So we need to make a decision for the sake of the kingdom it has nothing to do with what we want or what we feel like or what we think. But we need to use our free will, make a willful decision to give our will to God, to do the will of God with his help. Now let me just say from the very get-go, there is no way that anybody here can obey God without leaning on God to do that. Apart from him, you can do nothing. So it's not gonna do any good for you to hear me and say, that's it, bless God, I'm just gonna go home and I'm gonna, I'm gonna this and I'm gonna that and I'm gonna change this and I'm gonna change that. Well, truthfully, you will just fail miserably because God does not care one iota for independence. He wants us to be dependent on him. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that in due time he might exalt you. And to be humble means that we know that apart from him, we are nothing. On the other hand, if we don't have a strong desire and a strong determination to obey God, then we're not ever going to. God's not gonna do everything for us, and we're not gonna do anything without him. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you don't wanna do something, you're not gonna do it. You will not do it if you don't want to. But the other interesting thing is, is if you really want to do something in a strong enough way, you will do it. <laughs> you know what, we don't, we don't like to admit that because we'd much rather say, I can't help it. But I really believe if you wanna do something bad enough People complain about their time all the time. You know what you do with your time? You do with your time exactly what you want to do with your time. I, don't ha I just don't have enough time. You've got as much as everybody else does. We all get the same amount. Why are some people just practically almost useless when it comes to bearing fruit? And then there's other people who are doing astounding amazing things and they, they have these unbelievably fruit-bearing lives when both people have the same amount of time one person wants to do something with their life and they're willing to pay the price to do it somebody say pay the price <laughs> they're willing to pay the price to do it while other people just kind of want everything easy it's too hard it's not comfortable I got a bondage in this area. <laughs> Ooh, help me, Jesus, today. <laughs> Romans 12, 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, and I beg of you, in view of all the mercies of God, to make a decisive dedication of your bodies. So Paul is saying, I'm begging you to make a decision. 
That's exactly what I'm doing here this weekend in Hershey, Pennsylvania. I am begging you and all the people that are going to be watching this around the world by TV, I am begging you to make a decision that you're not going to live a mediocre, half-baked, sloppy life. The first thing that we could all benefit from would be if we decided today, I am done with excuses. I'm not going to make any more excuses. If I can't do anything else, at least I can take responsibility for my mess. Well, it's not my fault. If I wouldn't have been this and if I wouldn't have been that and if I would have had more of this and more of that, stop looking at what you don't have and look at what you do have. Maybe you didn't have parents that love you, but you've got God on your side now. Maybe you were abused in your childhood, but God is ready to heal and restore you. Amen? I had a beautiful little thing happen to me this week. It, God amazes me, just amazes me. I graduated from high school in 1961, and my father, of course, was very mean and abusive, and he would not let me do anything the other kids did, and I didn't have any friends. I was always embarrassed and feeling like the odd guy out, and he wouldn't buy my class pictures, which you know, if you remember being in school, that was an important thing to kids. Everybody was like, you know, trading pictures, and I didn't have any, and he wouldn't buy my class ring, so I didn't get to have a class ring. And uh, this past week, a box comes to the office, and somebody anonymously, which I think that's cool, because then it just looks like it's all God. <laughs> However, we do know that God uses people. Somebody got into the files at the school where I graduated, found out what year I graduated, my maiden name, and had me a class ring made and sent it to me. <laughs> Only on my class ring, I've got a Bible and a little cross. 51 years after I graduated from high school, God is still redeeming what the devil tried to take. How amazing is our God? So we need to always look at what God can do, not just what has been done to us. But how many of you realize today that everything that God tells us to do or not to do that's written in this book is for our good? I said last night, and I want you to get this, our obedience doesn't change anything for God. It's not going to make his life better. Yes, it will increase the kingdom if we contribute to God, but you know, here's the bottom line truth. If you won't let God use you, he will find somebody. I mean, God is not going to be unable to do anything because we refuse to obey. He will find somebody. If he has to look through a thousand people, he'll find somebody to do the very thing that he's asking you to do that maybe you haven't been willing to do. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be the odd guy out. I want to be involved in everything that God's doing in the earth today. I want to be part of what God is doing. I don't want to waste my life. So Paul said, look, I beg you, in view of all the mercies of God, to make a decisive dedication of your bodies. Romans 12, 1, let's finish reading it. Presenting all your members and faculties. <laughs> that means your mind, your mouth, your hands, your feet, your attitude, your finances, your entertainment, your relationships, presenting everything that you have as a living sacrifice, a living sacrifice. In the Old Testament, they gave dead sacrifices. God is not interested in dead sacrifices. He wants a living sacrifice. Holy, devoted, consecrated, and well-pleasing to God, which is your reasonable, rational, intelligent service and spiritual worship. And I love the way Paul said it. And he said, and don't, like, don't act like it's too much. It's the most reasonable thing to do, giving all. I said last night, many times we date Jesus. What we need to do is get fully committed. Amen? Go ahead and just get fully committed. 
Now, you know, God is not looking for sacrifices. What he's looking for is obedience. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 15. We're going to do a little study this morning using King Saul as an example. First of all, God never wanted his people to have a king. He wanted to be their king. But they insisted and persisted, and so he gave them a king. He found Saul, sent Samuel the prophet to anoint him to be king over Israel. And in the beginning, Saul had a very humble attitude. He was small in his own sight. But it seems like when God begins to use people or when great things begin to happen in their life, when they're blessed, it's hard to stay humble. We begin to think then it's all about us and, oh, I'm so great and now I'm better than everybody else, so that gives me a right to mistreat everybody else. And then God's not able to let that person keep what he wanted them to have. It's yet to be seen what God could do through one man or woman who would give him all the credit for what he's doing. So we're going to start in verse 1. Samuel told Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people Israel. Anoint, to anoint. I'm actually going to talk to you tonight about the anointing because I don't think we hear enough about the anointing anymore. Thirty some odd years ago when I came into this, that was all the talk, the anointing, the anointing, the anointing, the anointing, the anointing. I mean, we heard about the anointing all the time. You know, we better make sure that we're depending on and protecting the anointing on our life and not our slick programs. Amen? So tonight I'm going to talk to you about the anointing, which is the power of God in your life and how obedience or disobedience affects that. There's nothing that you can possibly have in your life that would ever be more precious to you than the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. We experienced a few special moments this morning during our worship of a little extra measure of God's presence and anointing. I don't even have to bother trying to explain it to you. You all knew God's here. And when that happens, amazing things take place. We're refreshed. We're empowered. We have hope. We believe. So he anointed Saul to be king. He didn't just tell him to go be king. He anointed him to be king over his people Israel. And when God anoints you to do something, it means he qualifies and equips you to do it. He took a regular person, and because he was anointed now, he became a king. <laughs> wow. Verse 2. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I have considered and will punish what Amalek did to Israel. Now, Amalek was an enemy nation. They'd been persecuting Israel. God says, okay, I've had enough of this. I'm going to punish them. How he set himself against him in the way when Israel came out of Egypt. Now go, instruction to Saul, now go and smite Amalek and utterly, utterly, utterly means completely, totally, Utterly destroy all they have. Do not spare them, but guilt, kill both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. Now right away, our heads go, well, that's not fair. That's not right. That doesn't make any sense. Why would God do that? You know what? Ours is not to question what God does. Ours is to believe beyond reason. That everything that God does, he has a reason. And listen to me, there is no, zero, no injustice in God. None. Absolutely no injustice in God at all. Just because I don't understand it doesn't mean that God is not right in doing it. So Saul set off to do what God told him to. But if we look down at verse 8, I'm going to skip a few verses here. You can read this whole thing later. If we look down at verse 8, it says, and he